Hi there, my front-end friends. Promises are an important feature of JavaScript, but they can be a little hard to wrap your head around. So today I have Christopher Danani with me to help break everything down because as well as I know CSS, he knows JavaScript. So thanks for joining me today, Chris. Kevin, thanks so much for having me. I'm uh, I'm glad to be here. Promises are weird, so I'm, I'm excited to talk about I, I, this. One. I'm looking forward to unraveling them for us. Promises are a way to handle asynchronous code in JavaScript. So I guess the to back up for a second, by default, historically, most of JavaScript has been synchronous and single-threaded, which means that things happen one at a time and you can't have two tasks kind of going on concurrently. A lot of modern JavaScript code tends to be asynchronous by default, but that was not always the case. And for most asynchronous code, the way that's working under the hood is with promises. Um, and so a promise, as its name implies, is a promise that something will happen in the future, is the way I like to think about it. You're not, as a developer, you're not often creating promises directly. You can, um, and there are absolutely times where people do that. So if you have a library that is not asynchronous by default and you want to make it asynchronous, you can use the promise object to create your own and, and kind of make it that way. But that's that's another video for another time. Um, but understanding how promises work can help you understand how most of the asynchronous stuff in JavaScript works and how you how you work with it. We're going to create a promise from scratch just to kind of understand what's going on. So um, I'm using the new promise constructor to do that. I'm assigning it to this, this say hello variable. But inside my promise, I pass in a callback function. And that callback function accepts a couple of parameters, resolve and reject. These are not like I'm I'm not passing any sort of values in. Uh, this is a little bit like callback functions in like array methods and things where the promise callback function is getting passed in some things by default and you're just assigning parameter names to them so you can do stuff with them. What I'm doing here is when I'm ready for my promise to be considered complete. Like the thing that needs to happen is done. I run my resolve method with whatever I want to kind of have passed along as some value for that, that thing. So I'm saying, okay, the, the promise has, has completed successfully and here's what you need to know. Um, so in this case, I'm going to wait 5,000 milliseconds, five seconds, and I'm going to resolve it with the message high universe. Um, mm -hmm. And to work with a promise, the, the traditional way to do that, we'll talk about a newer way to do that, but the traditional way to do that was with the promise then method. So I've got my promise, say hello, and then when it's complete, I'm going to run this callback function in response. And that callback function can accept an argument and the argument or the value it gets for that argument is whatever is passed into this resolve method. Mm -hmm. So what I would expect to happen here is I'm saying when this thing is done, then I'm going to log whatever message it receives into the console. And I expect that message to be high universe. And I expect it to take about five seconds for that to happen. So if I reload this page, you can see there's nothing in my console. And then right about now, yep, there we go, right about now, high universe shows up some five seconds or so later. Um, so that's, that's kind of the high level of what a promise does. Now, sometimes something goes wrong and the promise can't complete. Um, and so that's what the reject portion is for. So if something goes wrong under the hood, you know, promise callback function, you would run reject with some sort of error message or additional details. It doesn't have to be a string. It could be like an object or an array, um, number, whatever, any sort of valid JavaScript value uh, can get passed along. When I'm doing my promise then method, near the end, I can slap on a catch function with a, or a catch method with a callback function in it. And that will receive whatever was passed into the reject method as its argument. So here I'm saying, okay, assuming everything goes well, I'm gonna log that message. But if for some reason, somewhere along the line, something goes wrong, catch it and log a warning into the console. And if we jump over to the browser, you can see I'm unable to say hi. And in my promise, because this reject function ran, even when this set timeout resolves, this never happens. 
So this right. just, this never, I can even move this around, right? So because, because this is asynchronous, if I moved my reject after it, it's still going to reject. And then uh, high universe will never show up um, because there's already been an error. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of, that's promises under the hood. One other really nice thing about the promise then and promise catch approach to things is you can chain them. So um, here I've got this, this count method here. I am always resolving and I'm resolving with a value of one. And so I go count then, and then I'm going to, I'm going to log the number that gets returned. So I would expect the first time around that's going to be one, mm -hmm. but then I return number plus one. And the fun thing about the then method is it is itself also asynchronous with a promise under the hood. So when you return a thing, the next then method is going to wait for that to resolve and then pass the value of that thing along as resolved. I'm going to kind of repeat the process. I'm going to do it again. So what I would expect to happen here is we get one, we add another one to it, we get two, we add another one to it, we get three, we log another one to it, we get four, but we're not going to log. We're not going to log that one. Um, so if I if I jump over to the browser, you can see that's exactly what happens. We get one, two, three. There's no delay here because I'm not setting timeout to like hold off when this resolves or anything. It's just it's just resolving and returning the value right away. Uh, but the fun thing here is you can chain them. And the other cool thing is you can attach those then methods at any time. So uh, here I've got this promise called question. It resolves to 42. Um, that is a Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy reference for anybody who's like, why, why the heck does this guy keep using 42 so much? Um, and um, I am going to wait five seconds long after this has been resolved. And then I'm going to attach a promise then method to my promise and log my answer. As we'll see, it actually is still going to, still going to work properly. So even though that promise has long since resolved, I'm still able to attach the then method to it mm -hmm. and get my value out of it. Um, so that makes promises really cool and really powerful. You could have kind of a, a chain of catch then. So even looking back on, on this, right? I could, if I had this assigned to a variable of some sort, I could slap another then on it 20 minutes later and I'm gonna get, I'm gonna get four <laughs> as the, <laughs> the resolved amount. Um, so they're really, really useful. One other method that's worth pointing out, you've got then, you've got catch, you've also got finally. So the promise finally method resolves whether the promise successfully resolved or through an error, it's going to run no matter what. Um, so here I've got this promise that uh, has about a 50-50 chance of <laughs> resolving or rejecting, and you just don't know which one it's going to be. Um, so we'll get, we'll get the answer if it resolves. We'll get a warning if there's an error, but I'm going to get I run no matter what every single time. So we've got 42, 42, we'll never know, but always this I run no matter what shows up. Um, and so promise, promise finally is really useful, particularly when you're working with like APIs and things like that. And you have some stuff you want to do when things are successful, some stuff when they're not, but you always want to run some code afterwards. So like, for mm -hmm. example, if I'm having, uh, if I'm using a form and making API calls, I might disable the form. And then depending on whether it's successful or not, I'm going to show an error message or show like a, yay, you did it kind of message. But no matter what, when I get that API response back, I want to re-enable the form so the user can submit again if they want to. Yeah. Um, so, uh, which brings us to, practical examples here. One of the kind of one of I think one of the core like promise based methods in the browser is fetch, which you can use to make HTTP requests to remote sources. So it could be calling an API, it could be reaching for a file somewhere. Yeah. So I think one of the one of the most tangible ways of seeing promises in action is with the fetch method. So um, here I am calling the JSON placeholder API, uh, which is really useful for testing API calls. Um, and then when I get a response back, I'm gonna log them to the console. If there was an error for some reason, I'm going to log it. Yeah, should we dig into this or do you wanna, is this like a bridge too far? Do you wanna, no, do you wanna yeah, stop? Like, what do you, yeah, no, okay, no, cool. Yeah. So here, is, let me uh, let me comment yeah, like some of this out. Example. Cool. We'll take a look. So, um, so we jump over here. What did I do? Yeah, so right away, <laughs> we get back, we get back a success. So the call, the call worked. Um, one of the things you'll notice with, with fetch in particular is the response you get back is not 
the data. It is an entire response object. The URL that was called, the type, its status, the headers, and then this, this readable stream of a body that is not particularly useful. Um, I do want to show you the, the catch method here. Uh, oh, actually, I think this won't work. Yeah, no, no, here we go. So I get back a 404. Um, uh, it did not warn, though. Um, we'll talk about that more later. That's, that's a weird thing with how fetch works. But so the thing with, with this response is we need to then get the body itself. Um, and so that actually requires another promise. So here's where the chaining of promises becomes useful. So right, yeah. with the fetch method specifically, um, but with promises in general, um, there is the promise JSON and promise text methods. And those will get a response body and convert it into JSON or a text-based string, or I guess a string of text respectively. Um, because they are asynchronous, we want to return them um, and then use another chained then method to handle the result. Um, so in this case, we've got a response. We run response JSON to get the JSON data from that response, and then we can log that. And if there was an error, we can warn that as well. So let me go ahead and comment this one out so we're not cluttering up our console. And we'll jump back over. And now you can see I've got this JSON object with all of my different array values and uh, this, this kind of garbage lorem ipsum mm -hmm. as, as the data. If I were to use um, text instead, so if I were to go text, what I get back is this giant string instead of, um, instead of a JSON object. But either one is valid. A lot of it depends on what you're trying to do. So for example, if you were fetching an HTML file somewhere, you'd probably want text instead of JSON um, because you're getting back an HTML string. Uh, whereas if you're calling an API, it's usually going to be JSON. Mm -hmm. um, one other really fun thing you can do with promises is you can call multiple promises at once. So, um, you know, it, let's say I wanted to call multiple APIs. I could call them one after the other, but every now and then you have a situation where you need to call two APIs concurrently and then merge the data from both of them when they all successfully resolve. Mm -hmm. And promise all is great for that. So you pass in an array of promises and it won't run its chained then method until all of them resolve. So in this case, I'm calling JSON placeholder. I'm getting posts and users from JSON placeholder. And when I get my responses back, I'm going to use promise all again to get JSON from each of them. And in this case I'm using, uh, because responses is going to be an array of resolved promises, I'm going to use array map to loop through them and uh, basically repeat that process, creating a new array with my JSON responses. And then when those all resolve, I get back my data, which we'll see is actually an array of responses. So I've got my array and I've got two separate things. So here are my posts and then here are my users with their ID and their their real name and their username. This one's a little bit more, like I don't use this all that often, but every now and then, you know, uh, I think an example I use in my classes a lot is like if you're working with a, a newspaper where you need to get a bunch of articles and then some author data and merge the two of them together. You could loop through each article and make a request for the author and then do something with it, but it's sometimes more performant to run them at the same time and then smoosh the data together, um, cool. if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Awesome. So one other thing I like to point out, um, and Kevin, please stop me if we're getting too far into the weeds. No, I'm but, enjoying this. Keep going. So <laughs> promise then, catch, finally, they're great. But a lot of developers who are used to writing code synchronously find them a little bit clunky and awkward to work with. And so modern JavaScript provides a newer approach that allows you to author your asynchronous code a little bit more like synchronous code. Um, and it can make reading and writing promises a little bit nicer and easier. And I'm talking about the async and await operators. As an example here, I have, let me, let me reverse these. So I've got my traditional function here. And in it, I'm calling my fetch method. And then when it resolves, I'm logging uh, traditional fetch and my data. 
Um, and I've also got this console log traditional message. Now, when you look at this, you might think, okay, traditional fetch is gonna, is gonna run our log and then traditional message will. But actually what, what ends up happening is traditional message logs and then traditional fetch logs right. because fetch is asynchronous. So it, you say, okay, go do this thing. It runs asynchronously in the background. And then while it's waiting, this runs. Yep. So if we jump over to the browser and reload, I get my message and then my fetch response. Mm -hmm. um, and there's really not a great way to make this wait other than you know tacking a, a finally on here, which you may or may not want to do. Async and await allow you to write this in a way that's a little bit more like you might expect things to happen if you're new to working with promises. Uh, so if you slap async in front of a function, it converts that function into an asynchronous function. And once you have declared a function as asynchronous, it allows you to then use the await operator inside it. And what the await operator tells that function to do is do not run, run any code that comes after this until this asynchronous bit has resolved. So I've got the same exact code structure here, except I'm using async and I'm using await. And so what I've effectively done is said, do not log this message until this asynchronous bit finishes resolving. Mm -hmm. um, and so if we comment this out, uncomment this, so they will run and I reload the page, you can see fetch logs its results and then my message runs. Um, and a lot of people really, really like this. When you start running code this way, um, there are a couple of gotchas that you need to be aware of. So the first is slapping async on a function fundamentally changes how it works. So here I have, I've made this function asynchronous. I'm returning 42. I am running my function, assigning its return value to answer, and then logging it into the browser. And one of the things I find with a lot of my students is when they start working with async and await, they expect that answer is going to have a value of 42. And they're always surprised to find that they're wrong. It actually has a value of promise. And they're like, okay, well, so how do I get, how do I get it to not be promise? How do I get it to be 42? So um, the thing that happens is when you slap async on a function, it ends up, it always returns a promise. So at that point, you've effectively said, this is asynchronous, it's, it's a promise now. Um, and so whatever value you return out is a promise that will resolve to 42. Right. It's not, it's no longer going to just give you that answer directly. Mm -hmm. So what you end up having to do, if you wanted to log that answer, you have to slap then on it, or you, you know, you have to do the async await thing around it. So like, this is one approach, but I call it, a, I could also do something. Uh, I don't know why you do it in this case, but you could, right? So I could do like function get answer. Uh, or I guess resolve answer is maybe the the better way. Let's say log answer. There we go. So I could do something like say let answer equals await get the answer, and then console log answer, and then that would also get me you know running log answer would get me this the same thing. Mm -hmm. But you can never turn this back into a thing that just returns forty two. So like I'll sometimes I'll have students who do things like um, you know they'll say let answer equals get the answer return data, right? Yep. They'll do something like this. And it, 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 just, it doesn't work. You're always going to get back a promise. And so that's something to be aware of. But what it also means is that fundamentally the, the structure of your code is going to change a little bit. Let's look at how this might affect your code structure. So here I am, I am attempting to get an article by its ID uh, and JSON placeholder uh, has this awesome uh, kind of dummy API where you can pass in an ID zero to a hundred or something like that. And it'll mm -hmm. spit back a response. And I've got this written as a traditional promise then catch kind of situation here. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me, let me block out, block out the other one. So I pass in an ID, it runs the code and then it'll log the result. Mm -hmm. uh, and if we were to jump over to the browser, you can see, I get back, I get back this object. It's got an ID of three and I've got some content. Mm -hmm. um, if I were going to restructure this as an asynchronous function, usually the first kind of pass is, you know, you do, you do something like, like this, right? But then it really doesn't really change your code all that much. So what I recommend is you assign each step to a variable, just like you might 
a traditional, um, you know, like a traditional synchronous function. So mm-hmm. I've got async. And now instead of having like a, in, in one of the earlier examples, I think you saw, you know, I was, uh, you know, let a wait. And then I had kind of this whole thing going. Um, so what I'm doing here, I'm just going to break each step into its own thing. So the response, I'm going to wait my fetch return, and then mm-hmm. that gets assigned to the response value. Um, if for some reason there's an error there, I'm going to I'm going to like kind of throw this error that says something went wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, but otherwise, I am then you know this used to be part of the chained then method, but I'm breaking it out into its own variable. So let mm-hmm. data equal await response JSON. Yep. And then I can log that data. And this is going to get me a an identical response to what I was doing doing before. Mm-hmm. Uh, so here I've got my I've got my same object here. Now the last piece is if I'm doing this approach, how do you actually handle errors? So like before we would have promise then and if something went wrong, like this throw bit, right? You would get your catch method. Well, for async and await, you can uh, I've replicated my code here, and I'm sorry, but you um, you can wrap your code in try and catch. All that I was doing here, mm-hmm. all this um, all this code up here, I've just I've wrapped it in a try method, and then if at any point along the line something goes wrong, we this catch it. method is going to catch it and log an error in the console. So just as an example here, I'm calling an ID that's way too big this is going to throw an error on me. Uh, so here I've got my, my something went wrong right. message, um, which is not, oh, so that's what I threw, right? And so that's what gets passed into catch. Yep. And so it logs, it logs that warning for me. Mm-hmm. Um, one other nice thing about try and catch is you can also slap a finally on there um, and do like a whole, you know, this always runs kind of situation. So now, now I've got my then catch finally becomes try catch finally. The question that always seems to come up at the end of our videos is which approach should you use? Is promise then better or is async and await better? And the answer is yes. Um, (laughs) They are both good. They're both fine. They both do the same thing. I think you'll find that a lot of newer code leans towards async and await because it gives you a slightly more consistent authoring style with how the rest of your code base may be written. But they are both fine, and uh, you can even use them in conjunction. You know, like just looking at this code for a second, like I could do, I could do something like weird, like let data equal, um, you know, await then, and I could have my whole, I cut my whole kind of old school function here, right, with the, um, you know, return response JSON. Like I could do that if I commented this out so that I'm not doing the same thing twice, like this will work, this will work as well. So now this will get me my data and I can log it. So that's an option if you want it. So you can mix and match them. But I generally, um, I generally like all, all these videos, Kevin, my suggestion to you is whichever one feels more natural, easier to read, easier to wrap your head around, that's the right one. Unless you're mm-hmm. wor- working on a team, in which case stick with the team conventions because it makes the code base nicer for everybody. Really yeah, it. and if anybody enjoyed this lesson and they want to learn more about JavaScript, I, Chris is always someone I recommend for that. So where can they find out more? Thank you. Yeah, so if you head over to gomakethings.com slash Kevin Powell, um, you'll find a bunch of articles and uh, like other resources related to all of the stuff we talked about today, as well as the source code from uh, today's video. Awesome. Thank you so much. The links for that will also be in the description. And yeah, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.